Guten Tag, mein Name ist Friedemann Karik und ich begrüße Sie recht herzlich hier bei den Me Future Talks von Mercedes-Benz. Hier auf dieser Bühne dieses Jahr bei dieser IAA bietet Mercedes Ihnen das Gespräch an zur Zukunft der Automobilität. Wie Sie sehen, werden hier Themen verhandelt, ja, von der Elektromobilität über das autonome Fahren, natürlich das Carsharing bis hin zur Vernetzung. Man kann also sagen, die ganz großen Megatrends der Automobilbranche. Eine große Rolle spielen dabei aber auch neue digitale Dienstleistungen und Sie bekommen Einblicke in neue Arbeits- und Produktionsprozesse bei Mercedes. Stichworte sind hier vor allem Startups und die Smart Factory. Da Sie wahrscheinlich, meine Damen und Herren, nur heute hier auf der IAA live zugegen sein können, können Sie natürlich nicht alle dieser spannenden Talks sehen, aber man sieht es hier, es gibt ein IAA-Special auf der Mercedes-Benz Webseite und da kann man sich alle Talks, die schon gelaufen sind und die, die noch kommen werden in den nächsten Tagen, nochmal in Ruhe anschauen. Manche dieser Talks, so wie diesen hier, streamen wir auch live auf Facebook bei der Mercedes-Benz Page. Und deswegen darf ich auch alle Leute, die sich zu Hause eingeschaltet haben unter, oder unterwegs über Facebook, rechts herzlich begrüßen. Jetzt wollen wir uns dem Motorsport widmen und in wenigen Bereichen der Automobilindustrie, da steckt so viel technologische Innovation wie in der großen Formel 1. Seit 2014 fährt die Formel 1 ja konsequent hybrid. Und bei diesem Projekt, speziell bei diesem Projekt, war die digitale Entwicklung ein grundlegender Baustein des Erfolgs. Deshalb haben wir jetzt hier jemand zu Gast, der über 25 Jahre Rennsporterfahrung vorzeigen kann. Heute trägt er den schönen Titel Digital Engineering Transformation Director bei der Mercedes-AMG Petronas Muttersport. Er ist also unser perfekter Gesprächspartner für dieses Thema und ich kann Sie alle nur ermutigen, nach dem Talk haben Sie noch die Möglichkeit, hier live Fragen zu stellen. Alles, was Sie jemals über die Formel 1 wissen wollten, kann dieser Mann beantworten. Meine Damen und Herren, hier ist für Sie Geoff Willis. Jeff, hello. Great that you made it here. Join me. Now you brought a little film with you and that's kind of your daily work, isn't it? Yes. Quite beautiful. This is, uh, this sums us up. People technology, resources, machines, the mixture that's Formula One. Is it, is it that clean in your labs? Yes. It looks it, almost flawless. Cleanliness is really important. So it's, uh, you can't, you could, just like here, you could almost eat off the floor. <laughs> that's great. So let me just quickly uh, sum up the two, uh, 2017 Formula season so far. We're 14 races into the season right now. You just came back from a pretty exciting race in, in Singapore. Uh, with it, both Ferrari drivers retiring on the first lap. Good for you. Um, now you're leading the championship by 28 points and the Constructors' Championship by 102 points. So you're going to win, aren't you? 
Well, I think we were quite lucky in, uh, in Singapore. It was a, a race that we were concerned about. It's not got characteristics that are very good for our car. Um, but as often said, it's better to be lucky than to be clever. And uh, um, we were lucky. But no, the, 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 this year, we knew it was going to be tough. We knew the competition is well motivated, well funded, well resourced and very capable. And uh, it, it's turned out to be very hard. I think we're quietly confident we can win the Constructors' Championships, certainly more on our side. But the uh, Drivers' Championship, we're going to have to work very hard with, uh, with, particularly with Lewis, all the way till the end of the season. So, fingers crossed, work very hard. We'll see. <laughs> but it's, it's much harder than in the last years for you, isn't it? Yes, I think one reason is there was a big rule change we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and it's never been the case that teams have won, been dominant both sides of a rule change. So we're trying to do a first with Mercedes. You know, in 50 years of Formula One, if we can do that, that that'll be the first time it's achieved. Maybe you can fill us in a little bit about the basics of a Formula One team. How many people are involved? It's like, it's, it's like troops for you. Ah, you can see that yes. on the... On I mean, you'll be surprised. This is, um, we're on two sites. Our, our colleagues here in the power unit up at Brixworth and um, then on my, myself and my colleagues at Brackley on the chassis side. So we're about 500 plus on the power unit side and 900 plus on the chassis side. So that's a lot of people to produce uh, five cars a year. Do you know everyone by name still? That's it. No, there was a time when when we were three, four hundred people and knew everybody. Um, now, I know most people, but it's sometimes quite difficult. You, you meet people and think, I haven't seen you before. <laughs> so, but we try and keep that team spirit. Yeah. So we do a lot of work to, to keep building the communications. How many of them travel, actually travel to the races? On the well, we're restricted at races. Um, we're only allowed to send 60 people on technical um, jobs. We also have a number of people on sort of marketing, sponsorship, uh, and then supporting the, um, the, the evidence, uh, so supporting the efforts at the track. Um, this uh, picture here is a morning briefing track side. Uh, so we're being briefed by the strategy people on exactly what we're going to do with the, uh, the, the effort that morning, or maybe it's a, a briefing for how we're going to go through the practice sessions on that day. Uh, on the far left, I just spotted Nicky Lauda. Yes, three-time world champion, our chairman, uh, and very active member of the, of the team. So from the outside, it looks pretty simple what you're doing. You build a car and you win the damn race. But from the inside, I, I guess getting all these people, engineers working and focused, it's a pretty tough thing to do. It's, it's a tough thing. So we're very focused now on setting the objective right from the top. It, it, it may sound obvious. You know, what's our objective for this year? It's winning both championships. <laughs> And then from there, you take those objectives down. We also spend a lot of time defining the problem. You know, it, all of us, engineers in particular, we love solving problems. And we, as soon as we find a problem, we try and solve it. But the success with Formula One is understanding what the real problem is, setting the goals, saying that's where the performance comes from. And we use a small group of people, of specialists, to set the problem and then we use everybody else to help solve the problem and that gives us our strength. Oh, that's the definition of teamwork, I guess. Very much, it's a team. The people are critical to the business. Yeah. So you just mentioned uh, the rules change in 2014 and this year again. Maybe you better than anyone else in this, uh, in this building can explain to me and the audience what exactly changed and what did it mean to you? Here we've got an image of this year's car and um, the big change from last year was much wider tyres and overall the car is wider and a lot more freedom in the aerodynamic bodywork. You put all these together and the cars would be potentially about five seconds a lap quicker. This is very unusual. For 30 years nearly that I've been in Formula One, we've been slowing the cars down for reasons of safety, uh, for reasons of um, cost control, because it's easier to change the car than it is the circuit. And for the first time, 
we made a set of rules or we helped develop a set of rules that made the cars faster. So normally, when you have new rules, you're trying to recover the performance you've lost. Now, we sort of stood back and think, well, how fast can we go? In order to design this car, we have to sort of estimate where we will be in 18 months' time. And these hybrid cars are very unusual, is that their design depends on their performance, and their performance depends on their design. I'll give you an example. We're limited on fuel. We can only use 100 kilos of fuel an hour. So if you go faster, you use less fuel because the straight is the same length, but you go down the straight faster. I see. So it's a very unusual thing. And if you've got more grip, you don't break as much, and you don't have the opportunity to um, regenerate the energy back into the battery that we have in our hybrid system. So you have to change the size of your turbo and your battery and your motors. So you can't design without knowing the performance, and you can't get the performance without doing the design. So very, very kind different challenge. Domino effect. Very much, which meant that we had to use digital tools. We had to use simulation. That was the only way. There was no way to test this in advance. Yeah. But I guess you must have been thrilled in a way when you, when you learned about these new regulations as an engineer, opening new windows. We, in Formula One, we're very lucky. We, we, we live in a world of change, and the change comes in from regulations, from competition. So it's a real culture where we embrace change. And I think, in truth, that our comp competitors last year thought a big rule change would weaken us. But when we had the rule change, we thought, yes, this is our opportunity to succeed. <laughs> you know, we, we're good at change. Great. So you just mentioned uh, the digital tools you're using. How exactly did you approach this challenge, so getting this, even faster? This challenge is really about our simulation tools. We've built them up, uh, the, the virtual world, over the last uh, seven or eight years, we've been more and more restricted in testing. We can't go track testing. We can't do thousands of kilometers. So we've been building physical testing rigs. We've got wind tunnels, gearbox dynos, driver simulators, very important. Um, this is a, an image from the wind tunnel. Uh, this is a wind tunnel model. This is a 60% model we use in the wind tunnel. This model itself has got probably 3,000 parts to it and maybe 1 million euros to, to build this model. So that's the level of, of, of virtual engineering we're using. And it's all these simulation tools we use to, to develop the car. So can you say that the key factors for dominating the Formula One for the last three seasons, winning the championships, was also in the bits and bytes in the software? Yes, so it was the, the way we organized ourselves, the collaboration between the power unit and the, and the chassis uh, development teams. It was having the simulation and, more importantly, the optimization tools. We talk about holistic design, designing the whole system, but this was about making sure that we made the compromises. So we didn't have the best power unit, we didn't have the best chassis, but together we had the best product. and that's very relevant, I think, to automotive, where you have to design everything simultaneously. You don't have the time to do it in steps. And that's where the, the virtual tools, where the digital tools come to their fore. Regarding state-of-the-art technology like this, I, I guess Formula One is getting even tougher with, with each year. How do you keep track? How much do you have to change yourself to stay competitive? Well, the cars have to change a lot. So we pr the cars are prototypes. Uh, They change the car at the end of the season. Is, it may be 30% different, maybe 50% different. Uh, and the car at the end of the season, sorry, the car at the beginning of the season would probably only be mid-grid by the end of the season. So we have this huge pressure to change. And the ability to change and bring the changes in quickly is key to, to staying at the front. So businesses sometimes talk about the culture of innovation they, they try to foster. So what does it mean in Formula One teams? Can you describe that a little bit? I, I'm certainly a big believer in culture and uh, the culture of innovation. So change is what we have to deal with. And our current performance is, it depends on our capability, on our technical capability. And so our future performance depends on how quickly we can develop that capability. And 
to develop the capabilities is what drives the innovation. And we're finding that innovation very much comes from, from, from the bottom of the organization up. It's from the young people coming in from university, coming in from other organizations, different ways of thinking, challenging. And I innovation can be big. It can be a, a huge piece of equipment. It can be a, a new state-of-the-art driving simulator, or it can be somebody identifying a problem. That takes too long. I, I can save five minutes doing that. I do that a hundred times. I've saved many, many hours. Um, this is a, an image from our um, driver simulator. Um, it's one of our young drivers in the simulator. We use this every day of the week, and it's another, another key tool. So innovation, big, small, always driven through. And our role in a senior role is to encourage the ability to pick up the innovation and to, and to follow it and to develop it and to take risks. You know, we're very used to failure. If mm -hmm. it fails, we learn, we go on. So now we're coming to the one guy we haven't talked about yet, and he's only there for driving the car, isn't he? Or how important is a driver for you in the innovation? Drivers. Um, <laughs> kind of their own. They're a special breed. <laughs> um, a lot of the time I'm asked, how much does the driver help develop the car? And the truth is now, not a lot. But, um, and that's mainly because of the amount of data and the knowledge that we get from, from the car. But the drivers are very, very talented. And to give you an idea of the complexity, particularly with somebody like, like Lewis, who's now got the record for the number of pole positions, um, on a Formula One car, the grip of the tires is completely dependent on the temperature of the tires. And the temperature of the tires changes from the beginning of a corner to the end of the corner, from one corner to the next corner to the next corner. And the tires, sometimes aren't, you can't keep them in what we call the window, mm -hmm. the, the best place. You can't keep them for a whole lap. And people like Lewis are able to control each tire's temperature independently and to prepare them on their out lap for qualifying and to save them for just the right amount to use them in the right bit of, of the circuit. And it's really an astonishing talent. So uh, they are a very key bit of, of realizing the performance. And they spend a lot of time in the simulator. They give us the feedback. They tell us, I can drive the car like this, or if you, if you do this with the car, I can't feel it. I can't, I, I can't understand how to manage it. So that they are very involved, but they're not going to tell you, you need a bigger wing, or you need, <laughs> no. you need different rear suspension, or something like that. No. Well, what you're telling us about the, the tires and the temperature and, and how Lewis is dealing with it sounds like it has to become a part of his body or extension of his body. Really, as you just said, he has to feel the parts of the car. They talk a lot about feel and from an engineering point of view, we, we spend a lot of time trying to turn feel into numbers. So we do, particularly in the driver, um, the driver simulator, try and understand what does he mean when, what does he feel? Um, steering is a particularly important. Drivers are very sensitive and you do a, a steering. All the cars have got power steering because the loads are so big. And we, if we change that design, the driver sometimes says, oh, I can't feel it. And you think, what, did you do? What, what, what have we done? And that is a lot of work goes into turning those feelings into engineering data. And I guess for, for winning these championships in a row, another thing is very important is like a mindset of the winner. Because after three, these three years, you could be satisfied and say, OK, let's, let's have more holiday this year, aren't you? No, I, I think winning is um, when you win a lot, you want to win even more. <laughs> and the yeah, more you them. win, then losing really, really hurts. And I think particularly this year, we really want to, 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 to show that you can change the rules, but you still can't, uh, you can't dent our ability. And we know it's going to be tough. And we come away from a tough weekend, not downhearted, but we're saying, right, we really need to understand. We need to do better. You know, it might be boring for the outside world for Mercedes to win every day, but that's what we, that's <laughs> what we all want. <laughs> So even Mercedes can't achieve something like that on its own, and I guess you have a lot of strong partners. We have a, a very good range of partners. We obviously have our very high-profile partners, uh, particularly Daimler, um, where we have uh, strong relationships. We, I spend a lot of time um, in the R&D plant at Sintelfingen. Uh, we have direct projects 
going on. The, the, the interesting thing is that it's um, automotive and Formula One are still quite different, but the tool sets, the, the computer programs, the, the analysis tools are getting very similar. And so we're finding that by exchanging ideas and working in common projects, even though they have to be applied to different things, we're building up a lot of very useful um, interaction. We also have some specialist techniques where um, Daimler have been able to develop that we've been applying to Formula One. And I think I'm confident in saying there's things that we're finding in Formula One that we can we can share with, with with Daimler, particularly how we get new projects very quickly to the car. But we have other partners, Qualcomm, Patronus. Uh, we have lots of projects with them. Universities um, all over, in fact, all over the world, we're running university projects. Um, you know, innovation all the time, developing it's is, is key. We we can't stay still. We we have to keep developing. Standing on a stage room with, uh, surrounded by everyday cars, as I might like to call them, what, what kind of innovation can we, can, can we see trickling down from the Formula One to these cars we are driving every day? I think we'll see in two areas. We will see hardware. So looking at the, um, uh, the new hypercar, we're seeing uh, the power unit itself, hybrid, um, turbo compounded technology, battery technology, um, electric motor technologies. The Formula One power unit has uh, 150 horsepower electric motors that are physically very small and weigh just a few kilos, you know, 150 horsepower. This is technology that's surviving now for 10,000 kilometers in a Formula One car. You can imagine it will be very quickly possible to take that technology in 100,000 kilometers, 200,000 kilometers in a road car. But I think also it's the tools, it's the, um, the, the computer modeling, the optimization, what I call um, system level optimization, so that you, you don't just make this bit the best bit or that bit the best bit, but you work on how all the relationships and it's building that technology. Because if you think of a modern road car, it's a very complex thing. There's so many systems and so little time to prove it out. And look at the extraordinary reliability of modern road cars. That comes from not just rig testing, but the integration of, uh, of virtual world testing and, uh, and rig testing, just as we do in Formula One. So Formula One, as I learned, is not just a marketing platform, but something like a huge innovation yeah. lab. I think it's whole. very innovation-led, and I think we have very strong alignment with the culture and um, objectives of, uh, of Daimler. Um, and it's just a wonderful partnership to be in. Great. It's been a fascinating talk with you. Thanks very much, Geoff. Now's been the time for your questions. If you would like to, a little Q&A in German is no problem. I'm going to translate it. Otherwise, I guess you're going to be around for, for a bit yep, yep. here on, with the cars. So, ah, we have one. Just a second. Eine Sekunde kommt das Mikrofon. Hi. First, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting insight into your work. And I have a question regarding Formula E. Where are you going to integrate the development into the current structures, or will there be a new complete team? Or ah, right. You've asked me a very, uh, a very tricky question. Um, certainly, Mercedes is going to be involved in Formula E. Um, my understanding is it's the 19. 20 season. Um, the details of that haven't been uh, worked on yet. There's clearly parallel technology. Um, formula E at the moment is a very restricted formula, so uh, a lot of parts are standard, but that is changing over the next few years, which is why um, it's of, of interest to Mercedes Motorsport. Um, I'm sure the program initially will be independent of the Formula One program, but we will try and use as much of the, uh, of the expertise we have between uh, uh, AMG and, and the Formula One programs uh, to get that. Clearly, the racing knowledge is, um, uh, there's a lot of racing knowledge in Mercedes Motorsport generally. Um, longer term, I see Formula E, it, it fills a different niche from Formula One. It, it's clearly got a city center focus. It's fully electric. Some point in the future, Formula One is going to be fully electric, but I think Formula One is going to remain in this 
higher performance level in a, in a more um, engineering competition. Um, so it, it, different challenges. It's our, it's, it's our challenge to make sure that we can compete in Formula E well without compromising the Formula One program. So it's something that we're, we're thinking about in detail at the moment. Good. That's, thanks for the question. So we talked about the Formula E as well. That's good. And that's a good ending maybe into the future. So thanks very much for listening. Vielen Dank, dass Sie zugehört haben. Uh, thanks, Jeff, again. Pleasure. And have a nice day here on the Thank ER. You. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. Auf Wiedersehen.